Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm honored to be joined by Dan Bailey. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bart. Yeah, so I um, should mention you're the drummer for the great Father John Misty. Um, you are the creator of the uh, really cool Bailey Method um, series. You got one and two. Number three is coming out um, soon, which we can talk about later on. But uh, so the topic today is using vintage drums in the studio. Um, a lot of people do it, but there's some pros. I'm sure there's some cons, obviously. Um, so yeah, you're and you're you're a big vintage guy. So why don't we just jump in? And I figured we'd kick off with uh, maybe like what are the benefits of recording with vintage drums versus using just you know go out and buy a Yamaha recording custom kit or something like sure. that. Sure. Well, I mean, and uh, you know, depending on the application, the recording custom might completely rule. You know, or or not yeah. might it will because those drums <laughs> are awesome. Uh, yeah. But I, I think when I'm picking drums because I have a you know, a handful of, I got an old Gretsch and old Camco and some old Ludwig stuff. And, and then I've got, you know, some modern DW drums. I got some modern Q drums and I've got a Yamaha kit in storage somewhere. Like, yeah, it, I mean, it's just for application. It's like, you know, if you're, if you're playing on a tune and they go like, yeah, man, we really want like the 1968 Ringo thing or like, oh, it's, we we're really going for plastic Ono band, which in my case, you know, with my band, that's always what we're aiming for. That doesn't yeah. come out of a DW collector's. You know, that, like no. that sound, that sound is a, is a, a three ply shell from the sixties. So, and you can get it with Rogers or Gretsch or Ludwig or, you know, whatever, but that is the vibe. And there's something about how those instruments age that just gets you, you know, not only the construction, cause obviously in 1968, that was a new drum kit, but yeah. it, it gets you closer to that thing, which then in turn inspires you to play in the way that's appropriate. You know, it's like, if yeah. you have a new DW collectors with clear ambassadors and the thing is, Oh, we're doing, we're doing Ringo. It's like Ringo isn't going to come out of your playing because you, the sounds are not inspiring that performance, you know? No, no. So, I mean, that's a great point of like, it's beyond the like, um, Oh, it's what it does for you. Sh- yeah. It's about, yeah. And, and, and like, and I know there's a big thing too, of like, Hey, your symbol that you buy today is going to sound different in 50 years. Yeah. Um, so that's really cool. It's kind of mental. Oh, totally. I, I, for me, it's like I'm I'm always selecting gear by trying to be inspired to do a certain thing. In the same yeah. way, if I'm doing, if I get a call and the the references are all like, "Man, we really like the first a perfect circle record," you know, I'm not. It's like that's a very bright, shiny, modern <laughs> drum sound. Sure. That is where the DW Collectors is going to crush. Like it's going to do that yeah. amazing. Uh, so yeah, it's it's just about the same way. It'd be unfair to take a round badge Gretsch kit and go like, "Man, I really needed to fit on this nine inch nails track." You know, just yeah. that's not you're asking to do something it doesn't do, you know? No, exactly. Now, how would you say that uh, I guess it would be trial and error, but there's sure. it's not even a question, but it's more of a thought like it's easy to take for granted. Like, well, you would just use this for this and that for that, where sometimes um, and I think it equates to drum heads too, where people say, sure. well, you don't want to you want to use a clear here and a coded here. It costs money to try these things out. Yeah. So what would be a good rule of thumb of like, is Ludwig better for one thing? Is Gretsch better for another thing? Like if you're playing, let's say a jazz, you have a jazz gig. Um, sure. Is a certain brand that you like better for that versus an old I, Beatles kind of rock gig? I mean, yeah, I, I would. I always think of especially old drums, but I guess this is kind of all drums too. Is you kind of either you're either like bright and articulate or you're warm and tubby. That's the two lanes. Mm-hmm. And so I think of like even in the say you know just talking about '60s drums is like. A round badge kit sounds nothing like a Ludwig kit. They, they don't yeah. sound anything the same. If you put, you know, coded ambassadors on both sides and just hear what that does, it's the, it's the straight shell, it's the die cast hoop. Those drums like to get tuned high. They don't necessarily like to go low. Yeah. Uh, so if you want the like 60s, you know, rock and roll thing, you're going to go more the Ludwig, Rogers, you know, that kind of, that school of thing. Uh, Whereas if you if you're getting a call for something that's more jazz, I just assume that that means higher tunings, and sure. Gretsch drums really excel at that. Now modern drums like uh, modern Gretsch drums like from the '70s on do rock tunings incredible. That's just not always the case with the '60s ones for whatever reason. Yeah, but yeah, I just I think of it like, I mean, really, it comes down to too. It's like, oh man, we we have this, uh, you know, we want you to play on this jazz trio record, which obviously not the kind of calls I get, but. That just screams, you know, 20, 12, 14 Gretsch to me. But that's just because that's Elvin Jones and, you know, yeah. Papa Joe Jones. And, you know, just all those dudes played yeah, those kind of Joneses. drums. And so our, our ears are trained to hear that, you know. 
Well, you you bring up a good point there of sizes. So 2012-14 is pretty sure. much a standard. Um, just that old. I mean, that's that's kind of. I have that feeling of that. Like those are the classic sizes. There mm -hmm. um, is that your go to that that configuration. Oh, uh, for most sessions. Sure, I, I'm, I I use twenty two thirteen sixteen maybe. Okay. Maybe seventy five percent of the time, and I could honestly probably use it a hundred percent of the time if I really wanted to push and try to make it fit. Um, yeah. To me, it's really like there's you know there there's twenty two thirteen sixteen or maybe a twenty four if you have a rock gig. I don't have a heavy enough foot to make a twenty four sound good, so I just sure. stick to twenty twos. Um, and then there's the twenty twelve fourteen or obviously the eighteen twelve fourteen. There's like if you had, you know, when I'm, when it, people ask me about, you know, what they should get and stuff, I always think you should have one modern kit and one vintage kit. If you're going to have, if you're going to pursue this as, as at least a hobby, if not a profession, you only yeah. need two drum kits and you need, and you probably, if you're playing like with me, you know, I do a lot of singer songwriter, a lot of like pop sessions, a lot of rock stuff or indie, you know, whatever between a good 2012, 14 and a good 22, 13, 16, you could play anything I'd ever get called for. Yeah, and sure. if you had like maybe the 22, 13, 16 is a modern kit and the 20, 12, 14 is an old something or other, you know, it's just to get the maximum spread from a couple drum kits. Yeah, absolutely. But, but yeah, for me, it's it's no matter what I ever get a floor tom to do, I just always wish it was a 16. Anytime <laughs> I have a 14, it's like, I wish this was a 16. And that's just <laughs> however the way I, I hit a drum really responds well to a 16 and not so much to a 14. Well, that's a good point, too, because people play differently. Totally. Um, you can obviously your head selection is important. You can dampen things. You can do the old, you know, the tea towel kind of thing. You yeah. can put there's I feel like there's no definitive answer, but maybe we now I'd love to maybe go. I don't want to say drum by drum because toms are a little bit we can we can go toms, too. But but sure. a lot of times I think people, you, you, you know, a lot of your uh character comes from your kick and your snare right so what would be a good maybe some options maybe not what's what should we do dan but like what <laughs> what are some options to get some different some different bass drum sounds you know different head head on giant hole in the front no hole in the front like what what do you what are some of your your sure. tricks i mean the the three i i use most times are you know a full front head or no front head or I mean, it's really the three kind of options there are, or a, a head with a port in kind of a modern setup. Um, yeah. There's something about, it, it, again, this is application, so it's there's something about you have to make the bass drum fit the track you're going to use it on. So if it's if it's a singer songwriter thing, and I'm maybe you know it's maybe 70 BPM, and I'm playing brushes, like that's one where maybe a long, you know a full front head bass drum would really shine because it. I can't imagine the bass drum notes are going to be too close together. So it's like, oh, we can really have a drum that's going to set some foundational low end for this track and it's going to sound cool. Yeah. It's going to be interesting uh, because it has the space to work. Whereas like if you're doing something that's either, either, you know, very in a, in a disco way, dead drums, or if you're going to be stacking samples on something or there's programming and you're fitting drums into them, then something like a no front head, because it gives you that immediate attack and low end and then kind of no sustain that's going to sit pretty with that kind of production. So it's definitely, yeah, it's, it's really just having a, like a selection of tools and then applying them correctly to the the situation. Yeah. And people, um, love it or hate it. People, uh, replace the drum sounds a lot or, or, and I shouldn't say replace, you'll use like reinforce the, sl <laughs> the slate triggers. Yeah. Which, yeah. I mean, from being, you know, the drummer on a session and also being the engineer on sessions, it really does help to just like on, you know, small speakers or whatever, when you're checking, it does help to have that, like, just, you're not change. You're not totally replacing it. You're just, like you said, reinforcing it. Sure. So for people who, who obviously maybe don't know that it's obviously it's being triggered by your bass drum and it adds in a sample that you can typically choose like DW, 22 by 18 yeah. and it's like i mean it's a punch in the gut perfect totally. quote unquote perfect bass drum sound or a black beauty snare they really are <laughs> helpful yeah um, totally so it, for me i always like to uh i like to think you know obviously this has a lot to do with again the application and the knowing you know how the production style of the tune is going to go and all that but 
you know, I never want to go in thinking about what's going to happen to the drums later. Like I, I always want to turn in something that you could use as is. You don't totally. have to. I, I don't mind samples as a production choice. Samples as a fix is a bummer. Like that's yes. something to be avoided. But if it's, there is no shame in like, yeah, on the chorus, they added this, you know, sample, this bottom snare sample under my snare and it like lifted it into the chorus. Like, well, that's incredible. That's, that's great. That was appropriate to the situation. Yeah. I think that, I mean, we're just, this is kind of a fun, just throw everything out there episode. I think one thing that I didn't realize before I got more into the world of recording is that like people will use uh, one snare sound for the verse, then they'll use another snare sound for the chorus and same with the bass drum and a different reverb for every single thing. And, and that is really impactful. And that's where recording and everything can go um, and riding the faders up at, at the, at the course sure. things, yeah. that's how things get time consuming and really make it next level, um, recording as you know, obviously just yeah. so everyone knows that there's all these different options you can do with your recordings. Yeah. It's, it's, you can pretty much endlessly manipulate like the amount of pop records that the, I mean, for instance, and this isn't a, a, a shade on Patrick from black keys at all, but you can tell from those records that like, it's a lot of those tunes is like four bars looped, but that's the vibe. Again, yeah. that's the production style they're going for. That's not to say he can't play because obviously they tour and he sounds great. So, yeah. but it, for, to make the appropriate production style, they treated the drum tracking as if it's a, they pulled a sample off an old record. So you can hear that a yeah. lot of them have like the exact same hi-hat accent that happens over and over and over, you know, every other bar. It's like, yeah. it's not, he's not playing it that way. They've looped those two bars. And, but yeah. that's, Man, the end result, it's all, you know, does the does the thing you make sound good? <laughs> it's cool. I mean, <laughs> did the recipe turn true... out well? Then however you got there is cool, man. It's it's all good. Exactly. I think it's very cool. Now, um so with the bass drum, uh obviously there's there's a bunch of different brands. There's different woods, there's sure. reinforcement rings, there's not what that's all a bunch of different styles um which I think you've kind of explained that it's good, you know, whatever you can pick and choose what you like and you have to experiment to find it. But what about like gear? Like what about, um, is there a certain, do you use vintage pedals? No, 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 no. Um, I'm, I'm a little more, uh, retentive than most about that stuff. I like, yeah. uh, I switch out hardware every year at the end of a, a year's touring, even though really? it's, I mean, it's, cool. it's DW, you know, 5,000 pedals and 7,000 cymbal stands. Like those things probably outlive me. But yeah. there's just the mental fatigue of like, cool, we're playing in front of 35,000 people. I don't want to have in the back of my head that, oh, when's the last time I checked that the bass drum pedal is okay? You know, yeah. like, because, you know, we all have those those things. You'll be playing a gig and one bass drum hit will feel weird. Mm -hmm. And it may have just been that your foot slipped off a little bit or it, you didn't hit it the same way. But if you haven't been taking care of your stuff, you go like, oh, no, is my pedal breaking? And that can totally take you out of what's going on. So, totally. So I think that... uh I mean, vintage hardware, as far as, you know, uh, if if you say you found like a 19, you know, 45 wood hoop, you know, WFL or Radio King or something, and it has all the original hardware, that's super cool, but I wouldn't ever use it for, it's just too noisy. Yeah. The chance of it stripping out or collapsing is too, you're going to break it. It, it just, it, hardware is not, hardware did not get good until, you know, the mid eighties. Yeah. <laughs> for the most part. No. I mean, some of the stuff, I mean, that's. 80 years old. It's mm -hmm. like anything. Oh, yeah. like, I mean, you wouldn't expect a 1945 car to just fire up in the morning and drive it daily driver. You know, it's, you can't expect that out of a, you know, a speed king either. No, unless it's completely, <laughs> unless rebuilt. it's a rebuild. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Which it's, that's a different story all altogether. Um, but okay. That's a good point, man. You're, you're so right about that. Cause, um, I know, um, that, I'm the same way where I do some gigs where I use these little portable recorders. And if I go down one little battery bar from four bars to yep. three, I change the batteries. And it's like, it seems crazy, but it's like, I'm not going to worry about oh, totally. this thing failing. Yeah. So, um, okay. Now, uh, snare drums. Obviously, we're drummers. We love snares. It's yeah. sort of the, the spice of life. Um, yeah. Sn <laughs> snares is my, that's my, I, I don't. I'm not uh, that gear specific about cymbals or, or drums. Snare drums is the only thing. Like, I'll take a, a drum kit on a tour and use it for two years and not think of one second about switching it. But yeah. I'll switch snare drums every third show. You know, we'll have three or four on the road and we'll just rotate them just because you get bored. Like, mm. that's 
snare drums are my are my poison. Kits and and cymbals, I'm pretty like I more or less play the same cymbals I got from Agop in like 2009. Yeah, <laughs> Still, yeah. I just have my ones I love, and they they sound great. And so I don't switch cymbals that much. It's but snare drums, yeah, we. That's where uh, things get interesting for sure. So, uh, well, I agree completely. I mean, symbols symbols are different because they they're not. I mean, that you can break them obviously, but if you sure. play correctly, and they shouldn't be breaking, so they yeah. can last forever. But all right, so what what are your what are your uh, maybe we go? What are your top five snares? Let's say for the studio, and then sure. maybe if it's if it's live, is different. You can say that too. But um, what do you like? Man, I would so I would say the five that I use the most that I find myself using the most is a uh, I have a '50s Ludwig 400, which is that you know the chrome over brass pre Superphonic yep. with the yep. with the chrome over brass hoops. Really, if you can find old Ludwigs, if you can find them with the brass hoops, that's a whole game changer. Like hmm. specifically, look for you know take your magnet if you're at the thrift store, and if it looks like it might be like a '61, '62, if it's got the brass hoops, it's going to sound better than all the other ones. <laughs> Just gotcha. Go looking that's good for that. But yeah, the the chrome over brass, you know, superphonic thing. Um, I have a, a six lug Rogers Luxor that I got for like a hundred bucks oh. at Revival. That is one of the best sounding drums I've ever heard in my life. Wow, that's um, cool. Man, I use I use a, a Q. Their gentleman's copper for anything that's kind of hi fi or modern is such yeah. an outrageously it's it's what you think a, a modern Black Beauty is. No, no, again, no shade to Ludwig. They make incredible drums, but yeah. There's just a little bit, you know, it's, it's got a little more horsepower. It's a little thicker shell. It's got a little deeper bead. It just feels like it, it, when you hit it, like the harder you hit it, the more it responds. So I, I've really loved that drum for, for anything that's kind of high octane vibe. Yeah, that man, I went down the rabbit hole of watching, uh, I think it was a video with Elon Rubin. Oh my goodness, man. That. Oh my God. He is and I a, was looking, I was like, he is a monster. It. He's get, getting yeah. to see him play drums in the same, just, you know, like at, at NAM or at the Q office. Like if you get to see him play in person, it's just you kind of can't believe it's coming out of a person. You're like, I just yeah. assume this comes out because it's at a, you know, a big PA at a show or a, or a record. And then you just hear him play in the room. You're like, oh, that just that's what happens when he sits down at a drum kit. Like, OK. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> he's other unreal. instruments, too. It's like, he's, oh, he's, he's he's ridiculous. Yeah. Sort of a prodigy. It's not yeah. fair. <laughs> no, unfair. Yeah, it's 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 dumb. He, he shouldn't be professional level at like every instrument. <laughs> <laughs> no. OK, so what else do you like? Man, uh, I always think it's good to have uh, some kind of option for, I have a, a an eight lug, like a Ludwig, I want to say it's an auditorium. I, I'm showing how much I don't actually know about the history of drum companies by not knowing the model names off the top of my head. But yeah. an yeah. eight lug, 14 by six and a half, three ply uh, Ludwig, uh, you know, it's, I think it's like a 66 or something like that with a, yeah. with a calfskin head on it because that... Huh. That absolutely is like a sound. And if there's, you know, it's like you listen to a, a oh, what's anything Jay Bellarose does, right? It's mm -hmm. just, that's the sound of calfskin heads. You know, it's like that's, yeah. and sometimes that's what you, that organic, like kind of super wide, not, not super, there's kind of almost no attack on it. Just this warm pillowy thing. That's yeah, just absolutely. what calfskin, you know, calfskin heads do just from the, from the jump. So it's always, I don't ever miss them on toms and bass drum that much but having a snare set up that way is is definitely is you know something i use a lot and then yeah man kind of i would say that other you know so i got the the six lud rogers i got the chroma brass supra i've got the the q copper and the in the uh the a lud ludwig everything else is kind of man i i would say maybe my 15 inch i have a 15 by 4 20s ludwig Mm, cool. uh, nickel over brass that is just unreal that I got from my buddy uh, Mario Caleri who yeah, yeah. for some reason has always had like he always has 10 of those drums at any given point and he'll just kind of <laughs> cycle through them and so I've snagged a couple as he's let them go but that That's drum awesome. is just unreal and it, it just just sounds fake just a rim shot on that drum sounds like you're you're messing with it when it's you're just playing it. it's crazy god that's so cool I mean it's um, and you said 1920s I mean that's like a mm -hmm. hundred years old and it's yeah. Uh, these I just that's another thing that I love about the drums is like they're not we have this history that goes back so far I mean obviously way 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 further back than the 20s but yeah, it, yeah. Um, they're still so usable and the, the technology hasn't changed that much throw offs yeah you're probably yeah. gonna want to maybe you know snares update but um that's just so cool I mean the beautiful part about see the the problem with hardware obviously is that it, it just wasn't built 
you know, hardware is, is a, is a, it's like putting tires on a car. They're built to wear out like yeah. hardware. Your simple stand is going to break. It is going to strip out and you are going to have to replace it. They're not built for an instrument is different. You know, an instrument should be a generational thing. You can pass down if it's built well, all that stuff, you take care of it. Um, I, I think what people like either indie drums or a couple other people who are making aftermarket parts that fit old hole spacing, I think yeah. is unreal because now you're able to take like, I mean that, that, 60s Ludwig drum I have with a calfskin head has an indie throw off on it because, you know, the P80, I, I put my 10th P85 on it and just got tired of swapping them because they would strip out. And <laughs> yeah. so just like, oh, a guy makes a modern throw off where I don't have to ruin the value of this drum by drilling holes in it. Like yeah, that's exactly being able. I mean, that's what makes, you know, drum shells will always, as long as they don't get damaged, always be functional. It's just a matter of can the hardware keep up. So I mean, it, it, kudos to Ludwig and Gretsch for never changing their hole spacing. Like, if you get yeah. a new Ludwig, new classic lug or or super classic lug, it fits on, it fits on a '60s kit. You know, it, that's and that's fantastic. That's really smart. Yeah, I think it's true with so many things just in life. But like when when brands change, when they go, it's like the new Coke kind of thing. Yeah. it's like we're going to change everything now. It's like, well, don't change no. what got you there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Why? Why yeah. do that? Why? Why be like now? Uh, now we're doing X when we've done Y for 110 years. Right. Um, so cool. Okay. So then, and then Tom's, do you, do you mix match and do like a Ludwig Tom and a Gretsch bass drum? Or are you pretty much, I'm going to use the kit snares different, obviously you yeah. can use as many different snares, but are you pretty much keeping true to like, you know, or are you totally blending? Oh blending no, you just, you drum? just go what's, there's totally a thing where like, man, I, I love the thick Ludwig bass drum, but I wish this had the like a tackier, brighter Gretsch toms, you know, yeah. like you, you'll totally, yeah. I mean, I, I mix and match all the time. I, I don't concern cool. myself with that too much. Now, do you try and keep the same heads across the board or are you going, okay, I like a, maybe a, you know, a certain, you know, two ply head on this Tom, and then I'm going to put something different on here, or is that getting too, <laughs> too uh, crazy? So I use either like a two ply coated over one ply clear. That's like mm -hmm. my modern or rock setup, you know, whatever you would call that. Or I use, you know, one ply coated on both sides. And I don't got really it. stray from those two things. Cause those are kind of the two ends of the spectrum for me. You got yeah. the big, you know, a little deader, a tackier, boomier, modern thing with the emperor, you know, the two ply, and you have the, you know, the kind of spongier, uh, you can tune it up high, you know, kind of thing with the, the one plies on both sides. Now, the coded on both sides, that's an interesting, um, you know, you always think that like, like for me, I'm like, and I've said this before on, on an episode with Jeff Davenport about the history of drum heads, where it's sure. like, he'd say in a great way, he'd say, oh, try this one, try this one, try this one. And I'm thinking, dude, I don't have that much money to spend on that's, these drum heads. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But. <laughs> You know, maybe it's worth experimenting because I always go, okay, I need like a two ply um, ambassador top and a one ply clear bottom. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's going to last me six months because I'm not changing these freaking things and buying it again. Sure. But yeah. If you can experiment, I love the I've had kits where I've bought them and they've had coded top and bottom and I go, oh, my God, I love that. Or and I loved on a bass drum. I had a Yamaha kit that I got and mm -hmm. I sold, but coded, you know, batter head and coded front head. and I loved that sound because I'm always like, okay, super kick two sure, towards yeah. me. Then, and then, you know, super mic friendly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sure. They're, they're good universal, but, but it's really cool um, to have that, that coded on the bottom. That's a great point. It, it just, it, you know, it controls the drum, maybe like two, two or 3%. It's basically doing the job of you having like the tiniest strip of gaff tape on the bottom head without you having to do it. And yeah. I find that like, that's really useful when, most times anything I'm putting one ply coated heads on both sides, I'm going to tune kind of high because mm -hmm. it's kind of the vintage thing. And so it like, it helps take away some of those pingy basketball -y frequencies that can happen, especially on old drums that have who knows what edge is going on. You know, like it, it, it helps yeah. calm down some of its like internal little problems I find. Yeah, absolutely. It's, everyone knows this for the most part, maybe everyone doesn't, but things sound different in the room than they do when they're actually being, Recording. Yeah, absolutely. So what comes through the control room um, or, you know, if you're a, sometimes if you're a drummer, like I know I have like a studio space where I set it up with literally just the desk is I spin my throne around and there's my laptop. Yep. Um, Same here. <laughs> so that's, it's different when you're you're not 
you know, monitoring it differently, which, which we should talk about your, your home rig here in a little bit, but, sure. um, okay. So, and then symbols, um, just for your setup. So you said you like, you use Agop. So, so I've been a Istanbul Agop artist since, uh, she's 2000. Yeah, I think 2009. And I pretty much just play their traditional series. I have, mm -hmm. you know, I have, you're with somebody long enough, you end up collecting this giant collection of symbols, but I find the stuff I go to all the time. I'm just looking for things that sound like great fifties, a Zildjian's which yeah. Agop makes the closest to that. And I, I don't think that's, I think that's an objective fact. I uh, think you can even, I have, you know, a bunch of fifties and sixties A's and you look, you even like take a, a 22 inch traditional medium ride, right. Or something, you know, from Agop. And yeah. you, you look at it next to a 22 inch fifties A that I have. And you're like, Oh, that hammering and, and lathing sir, sure looks pretty similar. Like it's, it's, yeah, they've, they well, were, they've been the ones weirdly enough that took Zildjian's legacy, at least sonically and like ran with it. Like, yeah, to me, I, I, and I have a ton of friends that play Zildjian and there's, they make, of course, everybody makes great gear. So this is just picking nits, you know? Yeah. Uh, but to me, Zildjian doesn't sound like they don't open up anymore. Like they all kind of sound, I mean, I remember like I loved nineties, a customs because they were so glassy and kind of would penetrate and then get out of the way. Yeah. Explode. And I find that a lot of them just, they've made them heavier so that they don't break rather than teach people that they should be using the appropriate symbol for their gig. Mm -hmm. Like, sure. if you're in a bash rock band, a custom is not your friend. That's not what you should be playing. You yeah. know, you should be playing, playing a heavier a or something like that. It's, I think that, and I think that that's happened a lot with, with drum companies in general is they've, they've kind of taken the, the wheel from the drummer and changed their product to where they think people should be, whether they should be there or not. Um, but yeah, it's symbol symbols wise. Yeah. I just find I'm always just looking for, I just want symbols that sound like symbols. I don't want symbols that sound like they have like tar on them. They have holes sure. in them. I, I just want a crash. That's going to like blend nice with the track and a ride. That's going to have some nice like character or definition. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not, not looking to rewrite, you know, how Sonics work with my, no, symbol that's that, you know? that's that like studio thing versus the live thing where again, if you're buying symbols, you might just want like a good like series of symbols that yeah. are just really good for the track. And they're not like I imagine with the kind of music you're doing, you're not doing too many crazy stacks and all sorts of things no. that are like <laughs> doing that. So right. And Agop people can can listen to the Istanbul Agop episode to hear about where. um Oh, my God. Tomajuk. I'm going to forget his first name, but uh, the, the founder split right. off from Zildjian. And so that's where, I mean, it straight up is that. Right. Same. I mean, that's what I, I tell, you know, I tell people, they go like, oh, why, you know, when I switched, cause I was a Peisty artist and they also make incredible symbols. And yeah. Or, I mean, if I was on a rock gig, I would play Peisty cause they just crush at that thing. Um, yeah. but there's just a thing of like, they just sound like symbols. They don't sound like they're trying to be anything. They're not. It just, sure. when I, in, in, you know, my, my mental picture of what a 22 inch ride sounds like, that's a 22 inch traditional dark. It just yeah. like. It was the thing I was, you know, we're all looking for something and you don't really know till you found it. And then one day, yeah. you know, just like I had, you know, some friends that are that are artists and I like sat down at one of their kids and played. It's like, oh, that's the thing. That's what I've been trying to find, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, and obviously people can find symbols. Oh. I mean, everyone knows this, but I'm, I think you can there's no you can buy them. You can go out and find them and buy them. But but you might find them on Craigslist. I think that's a cool thing to talk about with all this is, oh, yeah, yeah. Part of the we're, fun is the hunt. These this right. the vintage hunt where you can find, like you said, in a thrift store and you see a superphonic, that is real. Mm -hmm. That is so real. People find that stuff. I've found some crazy deals and you 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 also get heartbroken because they go, Oh, dude, I just sold this 20 minutes ago. It's right. Like, oh my <laughs> right. god. No. Or like, oh yeah, there's this acrylite. That's cool. Oh, it came in with a, a you know a, a 62 club date that's museum <laughs> quality that I just sold for seven hundred bucks. And you're like, oh yeah. Oh, Boy. I mean, yeah, I'll take the snare, but you're killing me with tell me about the kit. <laughs> yeah, don't tell me about that. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. All of this being said, I think our target audience today is maybe someone who has like a little bit of a home studio. Sure. Let's assume that. I mean, it's crazy to do that, but let's assume that money's no object. And maybe we maybe we talk about a budget option later and I can chime in with some, you know, cheaper stuff, too. But like, sure. on your rig, um, I'm assuming you know, vintage mics are great, but there's, you could have new mics yeah. that work well with vintage drums is kind of right where I'm thinking, what is your miking rig? What is your setup on your studio? Yeah. I mean, everything I, I use normally came out of the box. Like I'm the first owner, so I don't use any, sure, of any vintage. 
for me, it's it's if you're a commercial studio and you, man, I have this RCA ribbon mic from the '40s yeah. that I got from NBC LA when they moved, and it's I, you know, I paid thirty eight hundred bucks, I got a real deal, but it's in the shop every five years to get re ribboned for a thousand dollars a time. It's like, and you lose that piece of gear when it's in the shop. I just, it's, it's not that there's a factory mentality to what I do, but it is like, if I'm working on an EP for somebody and I cut three tracks one day and the next day I'm going to go in and finish up and my preamp that my bass drum kick in goes through, won't turn on. I'm now at a standstill, you know, like, yeah, let alone, just the same way that symbol stands fatigue and stuff like man cabling goes bad internal oh, wiring God, yeah. goes bad like old preamps are noisy as heck there's yeah. just a there's a standard of recording quality that vintage gear sometimes cannot get to unless it's very serviced if yeah if you're going to go to you know a studio and they go yeah they, we have a 70s quad 8 console but we have it you know worked on every 9 months it's going to sound incredible of course but mm-hmm. they're also paying a tech you know 6 or 7000 dollars a year to maintain it and yeah. so, like, that's not in the in the cards for any of us normal folks that don't run a commercial studio. So yeah. for me, it's just about dependability. So, I mean, and, and just things. If we're talking no budget, you know, just the same way that a, a Ludwig kit from the 60s is such a ubiquitous. It's just everywhere. Like they, yeah, they, sure. they were super popular. They sound great. They've been used on every record. Everybody wants one. They look great. It just every studio is going to have an old Ludwig because. They're just a dime a dozen. They're they're easy to find. They sound great. All that. Yeah. Um, by the same way, it's like if you if you walk into a studio and they're plugging their kick in mic into a Neve ten seventy three, you know you're in good shape because mm-hmm. we know what a ten seventy three is. It's time tested. It's been the industry standard since you know the seventies, and yeah. it's just that's how I've looked at it. Is like what what do I know works? Like I know Camco gr- drums sound great. I know Neve preamps sound great. Exactly. And it's yeah. it's the audio guy equivalent of an old Ludwig kit, you know, except that this, this obviously would be the equivalent of like, I, for instance, I particularly like Brent Avril, uh, preamps because mm. he takes the original circuit and he does what basically Q did with that copper snare, which is kind of tweak and modify and modernize. Yeah. He's like, Oh, you know what it needs? It needs a tran, uh, uh, it needs a transformer that's quieter and draws less power and is more consistent. And it, we need, you know, to solder better than we used to, you know, it's just all the little things that make it functional are better. You know, so, yeah. so that's kind of how I, I like to stick to most of my stuff is either like Brit Avril, Neves, or APIs, just because those are, you know, on every record ever. So I figured, that's, you know, like that's yeah. what I that's what I grew up when I was just playing drums and I wasn't engineering on sessions. That's what you see in the studio. There's a lot of there's a lot of things out there that are newfangled and such, but when you go into a place that a room that works all the time, you see the same things over and over and over. And so I just kind of let that be my my guide, you know? So, I mean, and that's the thing of like, it is cool to experiment, but it's the same thing as like on a much more expensive level of like, um, I'm going to experiment with a clear snare drum head as opposed to a coded. But it's like, it's different when it's like, I'm going to experiment with uh, an API preamp versus a Neve. Right. We're talking thousands and thousands of dollars. So it's a little bit of a Unfortunately, yeah, you're not talking about a a $22 drum head. You're talking about, (laughs) you know, $1,500 mic preamp or something. Yeah, or Or SSL or any of the brands. Any any of those, yeah. um, Why don't you, can we hear which mics you use around the kit? Start, Sure. you know, maybe your input, maybe like in the order you do your input too. Because I find that interesting too. Sometimes people do hi-hat in the middle or they do hi-hat after the the overheads. So yeah, what's what's your order? So- so what I, yeah, what I do normally is, is usually 12, uh, 12 tracks. And so we'll go, you know, kick in as channel one. And that is, I most often use a AKG, the new D D12 VR, yep. which I really dig because I love a D12, but again, it's from the sixties and it's super fatigued and there are great ones and there are dogs, you know, they're, they're just sure. tired. And, and then if you change the capsule, you've, it's a new microphone. So what's the point, you know? So yeah, just buy a new one. Yeah. For me, it's like, and again, it's like, I just want it to work every day. <laughs> so it's just like yeah. of the modern mics, I prefer that one, but I mean, everybody makes great stuff, but yeah, the D D one twelve VR that goes into a, a Bryn Avril 1073, uh, channel two is, what am I doing? Say so kick out <laughs> and I'll either use a reverse wired speaker. I honestly don't remember the brand to me. They're all basically the same. The moon mic, like the sub kick, yeah. the, the EQ or whichever one is all over reverb all the time. It's just a reverse wired speaker. If you have an old standalone, uh, 
studio monitor, you can just reverse wire that out the back of it. It's going to be exactly the same. It's just the like low end reinforcement thing. I'll sometimes use uh, a large diaphragm, uh, either a FET 47 clone I have or a Vanguard mm-hmm. V13. If we're cool. doing like the big open kick, uh, where I'm going to tr- be trying to get like tonality out of the second kick mic. Most times for modern stuff, the second kick mic is just to give you low end reinforcement. Um, yeah, exactly. So I use the so I use the sub kick type thing on on most times. Uh, channel three, I do snare top, and I run a Bayer Dynamics M two hundred one, which is something my buddy Trevor, who engineered the Father John Misty Pure Comedy record, used on snare, and I kind of can't unhear that now. It's my favorite hmm. snare mic by a mile. That's um, awesome! I got to check that out. Yeah, they're they're it's it's just like uh, it's it's if a fifty seven went to college. It's just, it's just like a, a little prettier 57. It's, it's incredible. I was going to say, you're, you're not using a 57 on top. I mean, no. that's like, but it's funny. It's a variation kind of that classic. Oh, totally. You know. It's just, yeah, exactly. It's just, it's, it has, it has a little better, like hundred Hertz response, which in a snare is the whole game plan, you know? Sure. And, yeah. uh, and has a little bit, you know, that a 57 is great. And I, you know, they sound great on a lot of stuff, but they're, they're definitely narrow. They don't have a lot of top in, uh, no. clarity. They don't have a lot of low end capture. So yeah, having something with, especially, you know, snare drums, that 10 K crispiness is kind of what makes it stick out in a track. So having a, a mic that gets a nice portion of that, you know, captures it is, is great. Sure. Um, snare bottom, either like a 57 or, uh, was it a CAD E 100 I have that my, my buddy Jonathan, who also, who produced the pure comedy record got me, we used it, uh, a CAD E 100 as our kick mic on that record. And it sounded really? great. So I, you can find those for a hundred bucks on Reverb, hundred fifty bucks. Cat is not the; uh, they're not known as no, the like. <laughs> no, but they, they, this particular mic sounds great. It sounds like a budget four four AKG four fourteen, but like in yeah. the best way. And they're a hundred bucks. And so I, I've just kind of found, fell into using that as a snare bottom. That thing sounds great. Um, awesome. Snare bottom and hi hat. I just run into built in preamps on my Apollo. I, I haven't spent money on because look, if, if you're like losing sleep over that your bottom snare mic isn't going into an API. Like it, it's, it's a, it's a <laughs> reinforcement mic. It's not, or hi hat. It's like, people just want clarity. You're just get a clean yeah. signal and you're good. Exactly. Uh, I'm trying to think channel five, man, I haven't because of the moving and the broken arm, I haven't been on my rig for like four <laughs> months. So this is off the top of my head. Pop quiz. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to envision my, my, uh, it's <laughs> my snake that I plug into. Um, yeah. yeah. Channel five. I use, uh, you know, Rack Tom and, and Floor Tom are my channels five and six. And I use a pair of the EV ND 468s, which yeah. is nice. a really cool mic for, it's a really good dynamic mic. It rejects a ton, which I find with Toms, you're always just trying to keep symbols out of them. That's the yeah. the name of the game. Uh, toms are very easy to manipulate and do stuff with later, as long as you can keep your ride symbol from killing you in the, yeah, in the Tom mic. definitely. So the, the 468s do a really good job of, of rejecting, which I, I dig. Um, and those go through a pair of Trident uh, T4 Celebration channel strips. Nice. Um, just because I didn't... Toms are something, you know, Toms are something you don't really want to lose sleep over. So I find that, the, you know, with having a channel strip, I find like an EQ setting that I like and a, a touch of compression you know, yep. going into the box and I just literally fire and forget and only change input gain. So, cause it, you know, kick and snare really make a track. Toms just have to sound like good toms. So if you can get yeah, a good yeah. tom sound and then just by changing the drums themselves, you're going to change what you're capturing. You're, you're going to be set for, for whatever you got to do. Um, yeah. And I think, I think everyone, just so everyone's on the same page, I think everyone knows the, the series, what we're talking about with mics and preamps, but so a channel strip, so everyone knows yes. is actually like on a, on a piece of like, outboard or like like a like a mixer if you look down at it's your strip where there's typically like a gate a compressor yeah um EQ. there could be compress like th- there could be reverb yeah it's all in one um i use it obviously a lot built in as an insert in pro mm-hmm. tools which i'm using and it's just instead of having four or five different plugins you're using one thing yeah um so that's a channel strip um, yeah the, the ssl plugin being the best the, the one I yes. see the most that it's one of the the most used plugins I see that that exactly you can you can go from like a raw sound to input gain EQ compression maybe even a limiter yeah on the yeah. same plugin yeah it's great which I love the SSL I use the metric halo channel strip three 
And oh. I, but I, again, I do day in and day out a lot of voice stuff, which I SSL love. is unreal for. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah Industry yeah, yeah. standard. They're, so, okay, carrying on. So your Toms yeah. are the EV468 uh, into the channel strip, and then where do you go from there? Uh, so channel 7 and 8 are my overheads, which I use a pair of Cole's 4038s, which are some figure 8 ribbon mics, which are, I mean, if to me, you just put a Coles anywhere near a drum kit, and it sounds like a classic record. Like, it's just, it's because Pink Floyd... Beatles, Stones. If it was yeah. recorded in England in the 60s and 70s, it's on a pair of coals on drums. Like, it's yeah. just that those were the microphones. They're not the word that, you know, you can you can spend a whole lot more money than those. But to me, that's how an overhead should sound. That's, you know, it's it's a lot of like. Is a Superphonic the, the best sounding snare drum? You know, not that that's an objective thing, but probably not. But yeah. we've been taught that that's what a snare drum sounds like because it's on every record we've ever heard since we were newborns. Yeah. You know? yeah. So in the, so exactly. a lot in that same way, that like kind of darker, warmer overhead response, like that's that's the Coles thing, you know? Um, yeah. And those go through a pair of Brent Avril uh, 312s that I got back when he was racking old consoles. So those came out of an old API legacy console and mm. he racked them. Those, those sound unreal, but that... That's those awesome. those mics and those preamps are probably like 70% of my sound for sure. And that's where it's just kind of funny to note that like most of the mics you've listed so far have not been that expensive. No. Like nothing is that crazy. But I think then overheads is typically where that's going to be where and obviously your preamps and stuff is there's some money there. But, right. Um, but your overheads are where you you maybe want to put in a little. Uh, yeah. Overheads extra. and rooms because that's what's giving you yeah. the total flavor of the kit, you know, for sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and then uh, let's see, F7, 8, 9, and 10 I use are my room mics. And I use a uh, Vanguard V44S, I want to say the model number, which is a stereo mic based on a 70s Sony model. Um, cool. And th that mic in particular has been, not only is it only like, f I think, five or 600 bucks, it's not particularly expensive, but then also, I mean, I've, I've had mine for a bit. I know Aaron Sterling's been running front for a bit. I think Victor and Drizzo has one. Like I'm starting, I know Mario Caleri has one. You're just starting to see everyone get turned on to that mic. That's one that the the Vanguard mics in general are are pretty incredible, and it's one of those things that it's going to get found out, and they're going to be worth way more money. Or he's going to realize yeah. he can charge way more for them. So now's <laughs> the time to get in. But so yeah. I use a, a V uh, V44s through two channels of a of or two channels of UA uh, seven ten. Which has nice. that that thing has like a little built-in compressor. It's also channel strip ish. Has some EQ settings yeah, on it, sure. stuff like that. And then just a hi hat mic, you know, again direct into the interface. I don't I don't touch a preamp on the way in. Um, and then I run a mono mic that is evenly measured between the overheads. So it's yeah. like a so it's a mono overhead kind of directly over the the kick and snare. Um, and that will either that's the mic I do the most to. Um, when you know when I'll when I'll be working on something and I'll just clip a, a thing and, and post it on Instagram, most of my mics don't change in between any of those things. It's usually the mono mic that I'm like either compressing really hard or blowing out a little bit or putting a slap back on it or doing something. And for me, I that mic is for me. So that the other the other eleven are from the client. And yeah. the twelfth mic is I'm gonna try something to keep myself interested. And usually if sure. they've come to you to record, they kind of want your, they're obviously hiring you, me for my engineering as much as my playing. So yeah. it's like, I'm going to take a shot and you know what? You can always mute it. <laughs> you can always you not use it. You have to use it. But you know, it's nice to have some flavor or something a little interesting that maybe you didn't think about as the, as the client or whatever. Uh, yeah. And that mic, I run a, a V13 as well, a Vanguard V13 through another channel of 710, of UAD 710. That's awesome. That's the flavor mic, the kind of the, I guess it's not really considered a mid kit mic because it's, it's sort of higher. I, like sometimes I'll do it where it's like above the bass drum, yes. kind of closer to the knee. Yeah. But I guess you're going higher. So it's, yeah. And you know what? That's great. The knee mic or crotch mic or, you know, whatever words, you know, or, or yeah. sometimes they'll put it back behind you by the floor, Tom lo down low. Those mics yeah. are really cool. Cause they kind of a mic in the drum kit can kind of glue the kit together. You kind of get kind of the flavor of the whole exactly. thing and that can be yeah. really cool for me um it can be a real pain in the neck as far as phase goes 
sure, because it's 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 just never going to quite be in phase with the kick or the snare. So, it, which of course, and especially if you're doing something like blowing it out really hard or super compressing it, it's not going to matter yeah. as much because you're you're treating it so heavily that you know who really knows. But if you're yeah. If you're going for something really pretty and pristine, it can be such a pain in the neck to get a, a mic in that position to sound correct. So yeah, I've, that's for that reason, I've gone away from using one on most things. Sure. But if yeah. I was going to do, if somebody said, hey, man, I want Tame Impala drums and they're four cha- I want four channels, then one of my channels would be something like a mid-kit mic because you would lean really heavily on it. Yeah. If it's going to be definitely. the main thing, then it's totally great. If, it's, if the mid-kit mic is the foundation for the sound and you're going to bring other stuff around it. That's great. But you know, the, the, the way phase works, if you bring it up and it, it can take away some of the attack of your kick or the body of your snare and you, you won't quite know what's going on and you, yeah. you can get real in the weeds with a mid kit mic for sure. Well, I always, like you said, squash it. I mean, I always think of it as kind of a, a parallel compression for sure. Mic yeah. where uh, just to s- probably, you know, oversimplify it for people who are listening, who are now completely checked out because this is a drum show and we've switched to recording. But you basically take that mic, uh, you kind of in a simplified way, you duplicate it basically and you slam it with compression mm-hmm. very hard. And then um, you you blend this slammed kind of gritty track with the original and it just it does some awesome stuff. Yeah, it's what makes, you know. It, it's to me, it's the difference of uh, I'm trying to formulate this this thought, uh, which is has some some danger in it. Um, <laughs> it's the difference between a dude on Instagram who's just like recording his practice yeah. and a dude on Instagram who is actually working on a song. And you can yeah. absolutely tell the difference when people post stuff because yeah. your your treatment of drums is like it's not about getting the most spectacular sounding drum sound ever on a record. That's never your records aren't about the drum sound. It's about the no. song and how can the drum sound you know. F- form a foundation for that song. Whereas like yeah. if it's, if something ever sounds like too pretty and pristine and I'm like, Oh, it's, and it, of course recording your practice is absolutely the, the way to get better for sure. Um, Definitely. but when you start manipulating for musical reasons is really when, when I feel like you take the step into the next level of, you're not just capturing, you're now doing something artistic with it. Yes. And that's where, like it things can quickly get crazy with track count because you you Oof, might yeah. then have a, a verb for your snare and a slightly different verb for your kick mm-hmm. and um and i don't take for granted that people may not know that you're you know you send to reverbs and you do dynamics on the track like a lot of times people will just throw reverbs on every track which you, right you really want to be doing sends and all this stuff but that's a different podcast yeah, yeah. i mean <laughs> that's into the- see luckily i i i've uh, I, I, I know my limitations as an engineer and I know that I'm, I'm the, I'm gathering the raw materials for someone to make the dish later. Exactly. I am, go, I am the dude going to the store. I'm going to the farmer's market. Like, Oh dude, cucumbers look really good today. I'm going to get a bunch <laughs> of those, you know, like I'm, I'm getting them the raw materials to make the dish later. So I don't exactly. concern myself with treating stuff too much on my end because who knows what producer or engineer is going to want to manipulate in what way later. And if you yeah. do some heavy stuff on your end, like reverbs, I don't know that I own a reverb plugin, to be honest, yeah, um, yeah. other than built in, you know, software sure. stuff. Um, just because if you print a reverb and send it to a client and they don't want that there, you've painted them into a corner, you know, so it's, I, yeah, I try not to compress. I try not to, you know, just to leave the door, the doors open so they can manipulate, you know? Yeah, it can be. Also putting on like a blinder that you don't that you're like, oh, this sounds great. And you take the verb off and you go, um, that wasn't actually right. anything near what you so- thought it would sound like. Yeah, um, totally. <laughs> so um, just for fun, I'll real quick give you kind of the rundown of again, right now, everyone's the studio I work at is closed, but I'm going to give you real quick my rundown. And it's actually pretty similar, but it's almost more like standardized drum this is your home studio this is more what we use is more like standardized people come in they leave totally. they come in they leave churned out so what we do is and i gotta remember i haven't set it up in uh, <laughs> like four months now but kick in is a d112 mm-hmm. um into a uh a, what is it a vintech 473 which is a preamp that's a uh kind of a model off of a neve 473 um kick out is uh 
probably an excessive use of a U87, but it's a, <laughs> uh, either a U87 um, or a sub kick, which the sub kick, our little mount kind of just completely went shot, which was like rubber bands around the, <laughs> <laughs> the claws. Totally. Um, then that also goes um, into the 473. Then snare top is an, a, an old 57, um, has a really cool uh, feel. And God, I forget what the difference. There's the old. Um, One of those like uh, Unidyne, right? Like It was a Unidyne uh, yeah. uh, 57. Yep. Um, yeah. that's also going into the 473 and then the, um, snare bottom is an AKG, uh, an older 414. Um, then, so this is the, this is where engineers and drummers get different is in at the studio. I personally used to do it like you, where I put the hi hat at the end here and I had to like, yeah, for uniformity, I had to change it. Next is the, um, uh, hi hat, which is the little pencil, um, Neumann KM 84. Yeah. I always get it mixed up with the 184, um, which the rest of the mics, we only had the four outboard and then we have uh, what are called metric halo ULN8 preamps, which are super nice, mm -hmm. um, very clean. So five is the um, Neumann hi-hat mic. Um, then you go to Tom one. Tom, all the Toms are Sennheiser 421s, mm -hmm. um, which we got from a radio station that was closing and we got them each for a hundred bucks. Uh. Um, well, Which I'm is jealous. Just one of those deals. Um, then, so you go down to the floor. Sometimes on a floor, we can also do the the, the um, sure KSM thirty two. I believe. Oh, sure the the large diaphragm thing. The large diaphragm. Yeah. Um, but then, so overhead left and overhead right are both U eighty sevens. Um. Then we'll go. We'll go insane sometimes and we'll do underhead mics on the symbols of another set of the Neumann. We have three of them. Neumann, the KM84, yeah. under the ride and under the crash. Um, and then if we don't do that, sometimes an al 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 alternatively, we can do um, the green AKG tube, you know, old Bonham style <laughs> mics yeah. with overheads, which are really cool. Um, you just got to remember to turn the power supply off. Because uh, <laughs> it's separate and like you know it can be twenty feet away. Yeah, and then yeah. room mics we use the ear trumpet lab Adwinas, which oh, are those super cool steampunk looking. Um, yeah, I've seen photos, but I haven't I have no experience with those yet. But I've I've heard more oh, than one dude. person say they're they're cool. They're awesome, especially for drums. But if you're doing anything, any violin, cello, banjo, I mean, they are the. I'm here in Cincinnati, which is basically I can see Kentucky. You know, right. from from where I live. Man. so like yeah. this is for bluegrass they are yeah. like the mic um so that's pretty much the rundown of that um that setup so it usually ends up being about 14 to 16 mics or something like that which is just you know sometimes excessive but yeah but it, it's um, you know if you have the ability to record the options you can always mute them you know like exactly it, it sucks to like man I wish I had something else uh, I was trying to you know, um, maybe I'm trying to get more definition out of the kit. And it's like, uh, you know, the it's it's a tune where you're like hitting the cymbals really hard. It's like, man, I wish I had bottom tom mics, you know, like, which is a <laughs> exactly. thing you would do on. Like, I bet the the vast majority of things that say a Josh Freeze plays on is yeah. probably has bottom bottom tom mics because that's where you're going to get a lot of the tone in loud situations. But also it gives you a second shot at getting a little more clarity on your toms, too. <laughs> yeah and then we'll sometimes throw in i forgot that that mid kit mic which would be mm -hmm. sure the ksm 32 which will be right there but yeah you know what's just one of those funny things is you need a good uh mic stand because you're typically kind of booming it out really far right. and then halfway through it starts falling yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's so. it's a it's a time where if you have access to one of those weighted like big weighted yes. boom stands it's definitely yeah. a time to use one of those for sure yeah totally um, okay. So we've completely switched to an engineering and audio uh, <laughs> podcast, which I think is awesome. But, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there now, if you were a guy or a girl who really just wanted to get like, they just bought a Ludwig super classic kit. They have sure. an Acrylate or a Superphonic snare or, or Gretsch or whatever. Sure. What would be your recommendation? Um, you know, affordable, even down to like, you know, everyone loves the UA Apollo stuff, but yeah. Like, I mean, it's more tangible to buy like a focus, right? Something more affordable. But what, what's your 
kind of budget rig to get a good recording of your vintage drums? Sure. I mean, what I what I would say is there's plenty of I don't know the specifics or have enough hand on experience with many of the models to to really tell you exactly what to buy. But sure. It feels like there's a lot going on in that like an eight channel interface in the like five to six, seven hundred dollar range that there's a lot yeah. going on there that's good now that even five years ago there wasn't. I know a lot of the focus right. I know some of the M audio stuff's really good. I know mm-hmm. like Motu stuff is really good. Yeah, I, I mean I would say, you know, eight channels is about right. If you wanted to do something with some options, obviously with a two or four channel, you can record really cool drums, but you just you lack the options. You have to know it has to be a style in which that production style is going to work. Sure. Um, but yeah, with with eight channels, I mean, if you can do a kick mic, a snare top, toms, you know, now you're at four, pair of overheads, now you're at six, uh, and go maybe like a mono room and a hi-hat mic or a mono room and a, a kick out or a mono room and a snare bottom, whichever your particular yep. situation needs the most reinforcement. But I would yep. say even, yeah, kick, snare, tom, tom, overhead, overhead, mono room, and then use that eighth channel, whatever you feel, you know, you get the most benefit from. Yeah. yeah. And then, man, it's it's hard to beat one of those stupid packs of a beta 52 and 357s for like 400 bucks. <laughs> my mind. It's, yeah. don't, I mean, SM57s, well, every studio has a drawer of SM57s and they're always going to get used. There's nothing, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that mic. You can record incredible stuff with it. You could throw it at the wall. It'll still work. Like yeah. that's. To me, it's really hard to beat sure stuff when you're talking about, like you can get a used pair of KSM 32s for overheads and those sound great and you can find them, you know, a pair for 400 bucks, 450 bucks, you know, like yep. Yep. that's that the bang for the buck on sure stuff is kind of out, out of control, you know, same with EV, you know, I think EV makes a lot of really good stuff, Electro Voice. Yep, yep. Um, but yeah, I think, and especially like most things, I mean, looking used is the, like, yeah, a new 57 is 100 bucks, but a used one is 52 bucks. You know, like, exactly. get, the, get the used one. It's not like it's anybody who's ever soldered anything can repair a 57 because there's like three connections in it. So even yeah, if really. it has a problem, it's a 10 minute project and you're done, you know? Yeah, which <laughs> that's a, I mean, I, I've I, I've done a fair amount of soldering and it's very fun. It's easy to forget how to do it yeah oh, oh <laughs> yeah i hear that experience. but um it's super fun i mean i would agree completely and the only suggestion i would say for that i've learned is a good really cool kind of affordable mic that has a great sound that i used for a lot of um doing voiceovers when i was like you know kind of in that world a little more yes yeah. the aventone of uh, or there's a i say aventone a-v-a-n-t-o-n-e c-k-6 and c-k-7 are kind of um there's a there's sort of like the the AKG tube mics, but it's a very good kind of you could buy one. You could make that your mono room mic. Sure, I used yeah. to use that. They're like 200 bucks. Um, I mean, it's they're awesome. It's it's I mean, as much as recording budgets for bands and artists have been the death of the of the big studio, it's as just as much of that, if not more, it's that home gear is better than it's yeah, really. than it's ever been. And honestly, like if you have, you know, say you have an Apollo and you have a couple bucks and you've, you've bought a couple preamps, like you're on the level of most places. And now it's just exactly. about how is, what's your sound source as far as the instrument and how does your room sound? But the, yeah. there is not a gulf between like prosumer and pro gear really anymore. It's kind of all, all the same. Yeah. And, and that same goes with the actual DAW or digital audio workstation right. is, is like we were talking before we recorded, like. I'm in Pro Tools. Dan's in Logic. You can use. I started on Cubase. Yeah, you can start with anything. You can get a little Zoom H4n. You could get anything and just start um, recording. So just to tie it all together, you can. This all applies to vintage drums. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I, my That's my. Funny. I mean, the one thing I would say as far as like people wanting to get into it, and it's the the question. I do Q and A's on my Instagram all the time, and the one I get the most is. Hey, what do you think about this preamp? And it never fails that it'll be like a you know two hundred dollars a channel or one hundred and sixty bucks a channel. Nowadays, interfaces are so good and the built-in preamps are so good that until you're spending maybe north of six hundred dollars a channel, you're not going to yeah. see much benefit. You're no. actually maybe degrading your sound to put a two hundred dollar preamp in front of that interface. It's it's a lot of like kind of yeah. know where to spend your money. Don't throw good money after bad. Uh, I, I find that mostly those questions are people asking me permission to go buy the $129 art preamp from Guitar Center. 
Mm-hmm. Don't do that. The interface on your, you know, your Motu interface has better preamps already. You're just making it worse. Uh, now, yeah. if it's like becomes a serious enough thing and you're doing it enough, we're like, man, I wish my kick and snare, you know, had a little more depth and and density and, you know, like all, all the good things that a good preamp will do for you. It's like when you get to that point and you want to start talking about, I should buy a pair of, you know, API 512s or you know, Dekine, the four channel Dekine, which is really great. Like once you get to that kind of money, that's really cool. And that's, that's a good investment. And those will always be worth what you paid for them. Like that's, yeah. that's the other thing, much like vintage drums. If you buy your recording gear correctly, you're not spending money, you're investing. Like sure, the 1073s I own will never be less than worth less than what I paid for them. We've already, yeah. that happened, you know, around 2000 when everyone got into hard disk recording and decided they were going to sell their, their Neves for 500 bucks a channel. And some lucky people got in at the right time. I think now we're <laughs> seeing that like, yeah, the digital recording thing is here to stay, but putting the analog preamp in front of that digital recording is what makes it sound like a classic record. Or like a Yuri 1176 or, yeah. uh, the universal audio 1176, anything where that compressor is like, like you said, it's synonymous with like, it's good because everyone likes that sound and it's been on used on every single thing. So you can't go wrong with these certain, um, we've grown up with 1176s, you know, in our ears constantly, whether we know it or not, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, okay. Well, um, Dan, you're a knowledgeable guy on, uh, many, many fronts. And I think this is just a cool example of like, and I should just speaking as a guy who, uh, I mean, I guess I've done audio and drumming for a long time, and obviously you have as well, but it's really, you just got to start and don't be scared. Oh, yeah. And there's the world, there's so many, like, I got really into watching the Mix with the Masters series. Um, There's all these different video series where you can learn from these amazing guys. Um, Mm -hmm. It's the best time in history to get into all this stuff. Um, You know, it's just all the information is out there. And again, what well, everything Dan listed those mics until you get to some expensive overheads. But like I said, you can get a very affordable overhead. Um, you can get a, you can get a, uh, like you said, CAD. I mean, realistically, if you don't have any gear, get a $150 seven piece CAD drum mic set Yeah, and then switch stuff out from there. Like, you know, it's better to have something than, than nothing. Totally. And, and even if you're not, you know, cause a lot of people now, obviously, you know, especially with the, the pandemic mm-hmm. slowdown of, of, you know, I've been in a, in a physical studio once in the last six months. Um, yeah. now that it's all, I mean, this, this just pushed us off the cliff. It was already going to be all at home. And now yeah. it's, really all going to be at home unless you're doing string or horn sessions or something. Yeah. Um, so being that it's like, it's even if you don't want to pursue it as like, I don't, you know, do, I don't want to do drums for a living or, or whatnot. Would, who in God's name would, you know, given 2020, <laughs> but the, uh, the amount of, of value there is in just recording yourself to make your playing better. Even yeah, if it's sure. not about, I'm, I want to play on a record or my band's doing a thing or whatever even just to become a better, have more facility on the instrument and to like self diagnose problems or like, or to get the confidence of like, Oh, you know what? I, I, what I was playing does sound great. Awesome. Like now I have, yeah. a, now I have an extra confidence that I have a impartial record of what I was playing. Sounds good. You know, yeah. I think that it, to me, it's like, it's like, you know, an athlete watching game film, you know, it's like you, you play drums a bit and go like, Oh, you know, I, I felt like I was a little draggy. And then I listen back and I'm a little draggy, you know, like, yeah, that's confirmation totally. or like, Oh, I thought it was weird. Oh no, but it's great. Awesome. Now you feel more confident. You know, it's, I, I no, think that, totally. yeah, recording even just as a practice tool is, is kind of a, a necessity. I think too, it's a, it's super fun. It's incredibly fun to just hear yourself back. Totally. You know what you just did record your buddies, come have, have someone play guitar, have someone play bass, yeah. but also, if you're trying to do anything in this world, you need to have, I mean, really, if you're doing recording and editing audio, then you're already have your foot into editing video because it's very, yeah. it's timeline based. Um, and I can speak from personal experience, started out doing audio. I had a job for two years with a company doing their video just from like getting into it from audio. So yeah, it's not going to hurt. You're only going to pick up more, more skills that I'm sure even in your regular line of work will will, you know, show themselves at some point. Totally. So, um, Dan, why don't we tell people a little bit about, um, you so people can learn more from you from your Bailey method series. So why don't you tell us about that a little bit? Sure. So I, you know, be, be 
between doing all these, you know, Q and A's on Instagram and stuff, I, I started to realize that I would get the same, like, Hey, how do you tune a drum? Or like, you know, specifically, how do I tune a drum? Um, and I realized that there aren't, I just kind of assumed there were better resources out there. And I, I just don't not know that there are. Yeah. So the original plan for the first one was just to, I'm going to tune a drum kit in real time, which I do for the first half of that video. Like start from bare shells, all, all heads off the drums, starting from dead scratch in real time. So say, you know, I, I have a chapter in the video about tuning my rack tom. The, the thought is that you can sit on your couch with your rack tom and follow me and go like, oh, this chapter is 12 minutes long. It took him, you know, it took him 12 minutes to get that rack tom where he wants. Yeah. And it, because I think so much with, with the things I found about tuning specifically were, it would be like, hey, you should do this flash cut to it being done. And it's like, Whoa. okay, well, Wait. did that take 30 seconds? Did it take five minutes? Like if I'm trying to tune my floor tom for 10 minutes, have I like, am I just chasing tails here? Like what, what's going yeah. on? You know, like, yeah. so seeing it happen in real time is like, Oh, there's no, there's no little thing that I do all the time that I skipped that I forgot to film that you don't know about, you know, none, yeah, nothing exactly. like that. It's just, here's how kind of long it should take. If it's taking you longer, you maybe need more practice. If it took you, if you were way faster, one, you could be way better at tuning drums than me, which that's entirely possible too. <laughs> 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 two that like, like, oh, I missed something. You know, I think that the time frame stuff takes is absolutely an important part for feeling like you've actually grasped something, you know, that you're trying to learn. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it just it started out as me making a here. Here's how I set up a drum kit. This seems to be a value to people. Uh, and then, you know, just went and, you know, the, the, the first chapter is tuning the drum kit. And then I have a couple tunes I'm working on and I take those drums and put them in front of microphones and go like, and here's what that sounds like. And I tell you all the engineering I'm doing and not doing, not hiding anything from anybody. Sure, you know, like totally. I, I, the point is transparency. So you can, yeah. So hopefully again, comp, it's confidence building. It's all about like, Oh, my kick in sounds like his kick in. Great. That means I'm on the right path or like, yeah, I actually like what I'm doing a little better than that. Fantastic. That's amazing. Um, it's kind of like cooking, like cooking shows where they're like, Oh, now it's done. And it doesn't taste oh, like anything like mine. You know, it's the, yeah, it's, it's the, the cooking show is the perfect analogy. It's when it's, you know, they put, what they've just prepped into the oven and then take the done one out and say, well, yeah. what, how many times were you supposed to base that while it was in there? What, you know, yeah, what how, rack, you know, yeah, it's just, it doesn't always help to three fifty twelve 12 minutes. It's like, well, but what did you do in the, you know, is there anything I'm missing? Anyways? <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I think that, that that's it, the, the TV showification of learning has been bad because you just jump to the result and you may have skipped over some stuff to get there, you know? Um, Definitely. Well, where, where can people find it? They are through my through either, either my website, which is drichardbailey.com, or through my Instagram account, which is at letter D Richard Bailey. Uh, and there's cool. there's links through there and stuff. It's all on Vimeo, so it streams on you know your phone or your TV or your laptop or your studio computer, so you can hear it back on monitors. You know, it's, yeah, that's it's, cool. It's a uh, yeah, it's been it's been a really good platform. And that's then awesome. The second one, I get more specific into. Hey, these people have brought me these tracks. Uh, uh, here's how I'm going to think about this. And I'm going to set up the drum kit specifically to get a certain sound. And then I take the files I recorded and here's how I'm going to manipulate it before I send it to the client and kind of mm -hmm. walk you through what I do when I get hired to play on a track. Um, so yes, it, it, the second chapter is definitely more in the weeds. One is just like from, from downbeat, like how do I make a drum kit sound like a drum kit? Sure. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's super important to watch other people do stuff. Cause, uh, a lot of times you feel like you're in a silo or you might be doing it wrong or you might be doing it wrong and not realize you're doing it wrong. Like I mentioned with sure. like reverbs and these these things just of like engineering wise or tuning wise, you might like just, you might be doing something wrong and not realize it. I know I have done so many things wrong where um, it just takes one person to kind of correct you and then everything gets easier. Oh, totally. Um, well, and I would hope the takeaway from I, I tried to make. The, the first class specifically, the take, I hope the takeaway is, oh, he's doing less than I thought. Like yeah. I, there is no magic. It's just like drums want to sound good. Like they, they, they they're going to try to sound good unless there's something, you know, unless the, the drum has some really bad ply delamination or like it's been sure. dropped down some stairs. Like unless there's a physical problem with the drum or it's, it's just coming apart because it's too old and it hasn't been taken care of. Like, yeah, drums want to sound good for the most part. So it's just kind of like put a head on it and kind of get out of the way. And like the less you do, usually the better your results are going to be. Yeah, there's not really many uh, 
shortcuts where you can, you know, you, but things do, I always say kind of like time slows down a little bit. The more you do anything, um, totally the more comfortable you get with it. So awesome. I highly recommend people go out and check that out and follow Dan on uh, Instagram and, you know, try and catch father John Misty whenever we get back to the real world of, um, playing shows so man, um, we, we have and we have holds next year but i'm a uh, dubious <laughs> i know man i keep hearing people say it's not going to be till 2022 um yeah so and people can follow along with your studio build which you're posting some cool pictures um building a studio in your house and all that stuff um which is a you're doing it you're doing a real deal you know uh, trying to job. trying to find the right uh luckily i, I have a, a good buddy who's a studio contractor who that's what he does and like, like all things trying to, you know, if you want to set up a space in your house, you have a spare bedroom or, or an attic or a basement or a spare, or, you know, detached garage, whatever you want to do. It, it's all a, you know, just like any of this, it's a, it's a, you know, cost benefit <laughs> analysis. It's like, yeah, you can, you can take a detached garage and put a quarter million dollars in it if you want to, but <laughs> that is probably so overkill for what you're doing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's really about finding like the appropriate amount of time and energy to put on stuff and uh but yeah, it's it's nice to have somebody walking me through that. But yeah, I mean the the plan. I had a commercial studio for the last four years, um, and that I you know rented a was in a leased property and all that. And it just happened to be it was already kind of our plan. But then of course with the pandemic is like, hey, maybe you tighten it up a little bit. <laughs> also, yeah. like who knows? Yeah. I mean, at one point our our county and my county in California was like locked down to where you technically weren't supposed to like non you know, like I technically wasn't supposed to go to the studio. And so it's yeah. like, okay, in that case, I, I need to not make that be a commute. That just needs to be at my house just so I can yeah. control it. Just so who knows what goes on. It's like, it's, I'm not at the, the mercy of a landlord, you know, like it, it no. just, it just worked out. But yeah, having, having a space to, you know, be able to put up, whether it's your job or a hobby would be, would be great. And it, it's, it's uh, hopefully I'm not trying, I, I, I'm not able to give out, you know, all the details, like what the wall construction actually is, stuff like that, because sure. the contractor is obviously how he pays his bills yeah, uh, and he consults and stuff. So, uh, you know, obviously reach yeah. out to him, his, Matt Walker, he's on my Instagram. Um, yeah. if it's you have sign. any needs like that, but yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been a fun project and we're, we're about two weeks out from done or so. So kind of can't wait. Wow. Man. Cool. Yep. Man. Well, yeah. So people can find you there. Um, and um, I want to give a quick shout out to Peter Lemire or Lemire Lemire for um, recommending you to do yeah. this episode. I just think it's awesome when people suggest things like this because um, I probably never would have thought of it. So um, thank you to Peter and um, Dan and I. We talked a little bit before, but just basically on social media. So um, here we are. You know, we've we've <laughs> <laughs> hopefully brought some knowledge to totally. people. So, um, Dan, I just want to thank you for coming on the show and taking the time to oh, uh, share this knowledge. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at drum history, and please share rate and leave a review and let me know topics that you would like to learn about the future until next time. Keep on learning. This is a Gwyn sound podcast.